would just like to, I wanted to just wait a little bit, maybe a minute or two for, for more people who, who could be joining us. Uh, and then maybe, maybe at five past, we can just um, get it started. Is that all right? Yep. Everyone here, welcome to our speakers, um, Dr. Desai Chwandire, Zianda Fibana, and Richard Poole. Welcome to Prof. Melissa Stain. Um, thank you for joining us. We know you are on sabbatical leave. Uh, and welcome to, to the Wicked staff and everyone else who has joined us today. Um, this is um, the Wicked's Wednesday. Uh, it's a seminar that is held um, on the last Wednesday of every month where we just uh, talk about a wide range of topics, um, and try to promote uh, transformation within our society. So today we are going to, the topic for today is whose heritage? Deliberating on the importance of protecting the heritage of campus old buildings and the right to access for persons with disabilities. <clears throat> okay, so um, we have three speakers today. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Desire Chuandide. I will just uh, give you a, uh, I'll, I'll just give a brief introduction uh, and then Dr. Desire Chiwandere can take over from there. So Dr. Desire Chiwandere is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Chair for Critical Studies and high, in Higher Education Transformation at Nelson Mandela University. Um, his doctoral thesis was titled Munwese Yamayako, uh, translated, everyone is your relative. Ubuntu and the social inclusion, inclusion of students with disabilities at South African universities. Um, welcome, Dr. Desai Chiwandire. I will give it over to you now and you can give us your presentation. Thank you. Very much, Rudo, for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it. And uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to attend this uh, important seminar. So basically, uh, my presentation, uh, the title for my presentation is Inclusion at South African Universities, Protecting Heritage Buildings or Accessibility and Disability Rights. So the key issues around this presentation is the issues of inclusion, you know, inclusion of persons with disabilities, particularly students with disabilities in higher education, as well as the protection of heritage buildings. You know, most South African campuses have so many heritage buildings because they were built, uh, some of them 100 years ago, and also issues of accessibility. As you know, that in South Africa, we have the national building regulations which provides for the accessibility of buildings, particularly to persons with disabilities, and the rights of students with disabilities, which are rooted in the concept of inclusive education. So I'll just begin by defining key terms. Something. Okay. So I'll just define heritage. What is, uh, you know, there is always this idea of the need to protect our historical heritage. But for purposes of this presentation, I'll focus mainly on heritage buildings on campuses. This could include mainly administration buildings, you know, some residences, uh, dining halls, and even lecture theater. So what is a heritage building? It is a structure that requires preservation because of its historical, architectural, cultural, aesthetic, and ecological value. And then inclusive education, you know, this is actually an educational approach which promotes supporting students with disabilities to be educated with their non-disabled peers, you know, in the regular classroom setting, you know, with the, and this requires also the provision of 
various supporting uh, structures, you know, that could include reasonable accommodation, you know, and then accessibility, you know, the concept of accessibility is rooted in the United Nations Convention of Persons with Disabilities, especially Article 9 of that uh, convention, which talks about accessibility as, you know, as, some, as entailing the making it possible for persons with physical dis with, with disabilities to live independently and participate fully in all aspects of life. But yeah, I've just added campus life because that's where my focus is on students with disabilities. So when you look at the South African context, you know, mainly the issues of uh, built environment accessibility, you know, there's always, most scholars always argue that the built environment in many countries, including South Africa, including South African campuses, was built to exclude and not include persons with disabilities. So most of the campuses were built before we had like a supportive legislation which provided for, for disability inclusion or which provided for persons with disabilities as having equal rights to live and participate fully in those campuses, right? So in post-1994, we see a radical shift, you know, with the implementation of inclusive education policies, which includes the White Paper 6 and most recently the Strategic Policy Framework. So these policies actually provide for inclusive education and for maybe it's particularly for students with physical disabilities, you know, for them, inclusive education also means that the buildings, you know, needs to be accessible, you know, in order for them to live comfortably in the structures and be able to access lecture theaters and be able to learn, you know, without any unnecessary barriers. Then Article 9 of the United Nations Conventions actually to show that their built environment is physically accessible for persons with disabilities. And this requires them to build their, you know, new buildings or, re or, or rehabilitate their old buildings through such inclusive concepts as universal design, you know. So South Africa ratified, signed and ratified this convention, which means that most, you know, it has to ensure that its legislation and practices towards inclusion of students with disabilities you have to be in line with these obligations. Then when it comes to the, 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 the legislation which provides for the, for the, you know, for the buildings, you know, there's the 2008 National Building Regulations and Building Standards Act, you know, which obligates, you know, campuses to ensure that their old and new buildings should meet requirements for international and national accessibility standards. Perhaps this would involve that like a certain building, maybe a building with four floors needs to have a lift, you know, anything that has to do to ensure that that building is equally accessible to persons with disabilities. Then there is the 99 National Heritage Resources Act, which obligates universities to protect certain historical significant buildings on their campuses. This perhaps also includes that, you know, if any campus has to make that building accessible. They have to apply for a, a certain procedure. They have to follow a certain procedure. They can't just adapt that building randomly, right? Then what I was mainly interested in, so you see that in South Africa, we have got three key legislation. The legislation that provides for inclusive education, the legislation that provides for the accessibility of building, and the legislation that also provides for preserving the historical heritage buildings. These perhaps could be old buildings, probably old buildings, right? So I was mainly interested in ensuring that how do universities then balance the clash of accessibility rights? Because students have the rights to accessible built environment. And also universities also have an obligation to protect their heritage buildings. So my, uh, the, uh, my doctoral studies, you know, you know, help me to answer some of these, uh, you know, questions through the interviews that I conducted when I was doing my doctoral study. So I was mainly interested, this is one aspect of my doctoral study for purposes of the interviews that I'm, I've, I've analyzed is that, I'm, is that I was, in, I'm mainly interested in, in 
investigating measures that South African universities are taking to make their built environment accessible in line of international and national you know, accessibility standards. So I conducted interv uh, 28 interviews with disability unit staff members at 10 different universities, including VETS, uh, UP, as well as UG. I'm only focusing on how things since, you know, this presentation is at VETS. And then uh, I analyzed the data using a thematic analysis and uh, the study yielded four dominant findings. So from the data that I collected, you know, because I collected my data in 2017, you know, this was after fees must fall and accessibility of buildings was like a very big issue. And most of my participants spoke about it to say, okay, students are saying buildings, you know, they, they are calling for name change of buildings, but what about the accessibility of these buildings to students with disabilities? So from my participants, you know, depending on which university they came from, somewhere from universities of technology, somewhere from like conventional universities, and somewhere coming from old universities with uh, many uh, heritage buildings and others were from newer universities where the heritage building was not really a big issue. So one of the dominant findings was that there were participants who were actually uh, proponents of historical heritage, you know, but because of time constraints, I could, I won't be able to put, I didn't put the, their, you know, their views. So most of these participants were arguing that, you know, it's important to protect the historical heritage of buildings, and this should, for them, always take precedence over the uh, accessibility of these buildings to students with disabilities. And their justification was that, it is beyond the university's uh, control to, to make these buildings accessible because there is a heritage legislation. So they felt that there's nothing that could be done. You know, this heritage legislation should always take precedence. And some of the participants were spoke about their universities being built on historical sites and that on its own made it impossible for them to adapt their buildings. And one of the participants in the uh, Western Cape you know, she spoke about the university having won a, a prize for the best building, like the architecture. So for that reason, they can't adapt the building and they have to apply for, for, you know, for that process, which they found to be bureaucratic, you know, and not a priority. Then there were also participants whom, uh, whom I've referred to as having taken a moderate this was more of like a balanced view. So they were, for these participants, they were talking about the need to strike a balance, you know, for protecting the heritage of old buildings, because some of them did say that they like the heritage of, you know, old buildings, the facade, but it's also important to ensure that, you know, that building will be made accessible to students with disabilities. So for these participants, they, were, they felt that they believe that the, if this approach were to be operationalized, you know, it could benefit the university on the one hand by still maintaining the old structure, but at the same time, making it accessible to students with disabilities. This could involve taking minor adaptations. And some of the participants were saying that even if, you know, you can provide a ramp at the back of the building, the important, at the end of the day, the important thing is that the student will have access to the building. Then some said, no, actually the ramp has to be in front of the building so that every student can feel that they belong to the university, you know? And among these participants, there were also other participants who were quite skeptical of universities, perhaps using the idea of historical heritage preservation argument to actually escape their obligation to add necessary accessibility features on the buildings. So this could include the ramps. So some of the participants were saying that universities are saying this is a heritage building, but just adding a ramp does not necessarily alter the structure of the building. Then the other participants were actually the critics of the heritage preservation. So the so these participants actually takes a human rights approach, you know. So they they were saying that, you know preserving the heritage of building at the cost of accessibility you know, 
for students with disabilities is, unreal, is unrealistic and unreasonable. So for them, they were more concerned about issues of accessibility, not only accessibility, but the safety of buildings. You know, for them, it was more about what's the point of preserving the heritage of the building when the building is inaccessible and the building is unsafe for students with disabilities, you know. And some of them spoke about the need to, they found protecting heritage uh, buildings, inaccessible old buildings to be a grave uh, human rights violation uh, and other democratic principles in, enshrined on the South African constitution and disability policies. So most of these participants were talking about, you know, the language of this is unfair, you know, this is a social injustice, it's inequality, you know, it reinforces inequality, and also it's a violation of human rights, particularly disability rights. Then lastly, there were participants who spoke about the idea of the political will to say, actually, uh, all the buildings can be made accessible, especially if the university for the university and you know Cambridge University that despite these universities being old, they have done quite a lot in making their heritage buildings more accessible. Some of them even gave an example of VETS. You know, they said VETS has done quite a lot, you know, to make their buildings accessible. And there was also one participant who spoke about, you know, their universities in uh, management taking proactive measures to ensure that they rehabilitate their old buildings to make them accessible, you know, which I would kind of so it was more coming best, best practice exemplar, you know, for promoting disability accessibility. But he only spoke about, uh, you know, the installation of ramps. I don't know if the university takes further initiatives, perhaps to install lifts and other things. And other participants have actually spoke about the bottom, what I've referred to as a bottom up approach to say, there is a need to include students with disabilities themselves, especially students with physical disabilities, wheelchair users, who are the end users of these uh, buildings in the dialogues around accessibility issues. Because as you will notice that he, most of the literature in higher education talks about uh, students with disabilities being excluded, you know, when in, when in terms of consultation around issues of disability inclusion. So it's mainly the top down approach where the management and the disability unit staff members are the ones who only make decisions for persons with disabilities, right? And then in conclusion, uh, the findings of the studies shows that, you know, provisions of inclusive education policies, heritage legislation and national building regulations are being implemented and systematically by different universities, depending perhaps on the commitment to prioritize accessibility issues, heritage protection, and in some cases, both. So there is no systematic approach that universities have in South Africa, which is true even with inclusive education. Most universities prioritize inclusive, inclusive education based on the resource, financial and human resources that they have to push for that agenda. Therefore, this reinforces social exclusion of persons or students with disabilities by denying them equal opportunities to live independently and participate fully, not only in academic, but in social life, be it in residence, participating in extracurricular activities. And in terms of recommendations, I would really appreciate if you could help in coming up with recommendations, but I just felt that there is a need for monitoring mechanisms to ensure that these three policies or three key legislation are implemented you know, fairly. And perhaps there's also a need to consult with as many relevant stakeholders as possible in universities, including students with disabilities on how institutions can make heritage buildings accessible, more accessible. So yeah, I think that's all from my presentation. I just want to say that this article will be published by uh, 
Herald in Eastern Cape West University. Tomorrow, I submitted it as part of the special edition, Heritage, uh, uh, Heritage Day special edition. So it will be published tomorrow for anyone who wants to see it, like who wants to read it, you know, in greater detail to see the in depth of the discussion, you know, you are welcome to contact me on any of those emails, then I can forward it to you, or I can forward it to Rudo to share with everyone. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it and I look forward to engaging with you after this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Desire Chwandire, for that uh, presentation. Maybe you could also, if there is a link to, to, to this um, article, maybe you can just uh, put it in the chat and then people can also uh, get access to, to that article. Or maybe you can send it to Kudzai or to me via email and we can just uh, spread it around to everyone. But uh, thank you so much for, for that presentation. Uh, it's. Uh, I thought it was quite interesting to to hear about the the, the reasons uh, why different universities um, implement uh, uh, strategies for accessibility for students with disabilities or why they don't, and the different legislations. So I would just like to to open it up if there is someone who has a comment or a question, maybe we can just take one or two for Dr. Chiwandire and uh, leave the rest for, for the question and answer at the end. But for now, we can take a comment or two uh, if there is a, someone with a burning one that they really need to ask. Uh, I see I see your hand, Kudzai. Uh, thank you, Rudo, and thank you, Doc, for such a great presentation. Well, my, mine is, is um, um, just a simple question around whether you found if there were any sort of empathetic responses that came with the whole, with the people that felt that it's too hectic, um, the processes to be followed before you change all of these buildings uh, for them to be accessible. Did you sort of, were you able to sort of tap into sort of establish if there was any form of empathy or uh, regarding the actual necessity of having these um, these structures sort of uh, rearranged. Yes, thank you for <clears throat> for your question. I, I think from my uh, from when I was doing the what do you call it, the interviews. So there was you know it. I also had a chance to interview uh, what do you call. Uh, disability unit staff members uh, with disabilities, most of whom were wheelchair users. So I think from them, they were the ones who were more into against this heritage preservation. But also I got a sense that most of the participants didn't actually know, or they were not familiar on how you go about, you know, applying to make these buildings accessible. So I don't think most it's part of most universities uh, conversation or there is uh, what you call guidelines in place or even if it's a, like a priority to ensure that you know if you want to make the building accessible these are the criteria that you follow so it was mainly coming out from their personal experiences if you know what i mean i don't know if that answers your question yeah yeah um it definitely does um and, and, and yeah, maybe I'll I'll just uh, maybe preserve my comments for the other presentations. But I just yeah, just to also add on there that then it, it's quite concerning if if there is sort of that lack lack of the ability to really see it from the people living with disabilities angle uh, from a general perspective. But thank you so much, Doc. My pleasure. Uh all right, thank you. Thank you for that, um, Kudzai and uh, Doc. Um, for, for, for anyone else who may have comments or questions, maybe we can put those in the chat and then we can come back to them. Uh, for now, I would just like to, to introduce our, our second presenter. Um, this is um, Zianda, Zianda Febana. 
Zianda is a student success practitioner at the University of South Africa Student Retention Unit. She is also a PhD candidate at Rhodes University's Department of Political and International Studies, and her thesis is on the conservation of historical architecture at historically white South African universities, a form of symbolic violence perpetuated against people with disabilities. Um, Sianda, sorry, Zianda, over to you. Is Zianda still with us? Zianda, I, I don't seem I don't to see her name yeah, in the yeah. in the in the participants. Maybe her network dropped or something. Um, but that's okay. It's fine. As 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 we wait for her, maybe to reconnect. Maybe we can we can move on to to our third speaker. Um, our third speaker is is Richard Poole. Richard Poole is a career academic and has been lecturing taxation at Rhodes University since 2000. He holds an a MCOM degree in taxation from Rhodes University and a master tax practitioner with the South African Institute of Taxation. He is very much involved in disability inclusion issues and universal design and is one of Rhodes University Disability Committee members. Um, Richard, maybe you can just, I will just hand it over to you and then you can give us your presentation. All right, thanks very much, Ruda. <clears throat> um, firstly, I'd just like to say thanks very much to uh, Kutzai and to Des for um, getting me on this uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, I must say I'm a newbie to this sort of thing. I spend most of my days with my face buried in the various taxing statutes. So, but it's actually nice to get out into a platform where we can talk about uh, disability and issues relating to disability. Um, most of what I hope to share this afternoon is not going to be via a PowerPoint presentation, um, but I thought I'd just share some of my personal experiences. Now, I am a person with a disability. I was born with prenatal cerebral palsy. I suffer from um, dystonic uh, athetoid right heavy plegia, so I'm heavy plegic. And uh, it, it does, from time to time, given the fact that my muscle tone does change from uh, day to day, you know, there are days that are a lot easier and there are a lot of days that, you know, are quite hard. And so when we're looking at accessibility and issues relating to accessibility and being able to move freely around a campus or freely around buildings on tertiary education or higher education institutions. You know, I've got a lot of personal experience. And um, I also need to thank uh, Dr. Des Jurandire again, um, because a lot of uh, what I've been doing in the last couple of years is when, when uh, Des was doing his PhD, he invited me to take some of his um, honor students around the campus and just show them, you know, what the architecture was like and but, and my attitude at that stage was to ask the students to put themselves in the position of someone who has a disability, someone who may be wheelchair bound, someone who might, you know, have need for calipers to get around on campus, someone who might have, you know, dystonia like I do, someone who may have had a stroke. Um, you know, in my case, I present quite often as though I've had a stroke. So, you know, my, my lateral line of my hips is, is a little bit skew. Uh, my right arm is sometimes internally rotated and my right knee tends to internally rotate as well with the with the right foot as well so you know i mean i've, I've got a lot of personal experience in, in trying to navigate my way around um, some buildings some of which are new and some of which are old and what i did it with with with, uh, with these honor students is i just took them on a walk across campus and i asked them to think well how would you negotiate your way into this building if if you were say someone who was in a, in a wheelchair, because Des is quite right, you know, the, the architecture of a lot of these older buildings on our campuses, and uh, you know, this is, this is pervasive. It, it, you, you will find this on just about every single university campus or um, the uh, universities of technology, that 
when you get to the front of the main administration building, you are presented with a flight of stairs. Now, someone in a wheelchair cannot get up a flight of stairs. And I've intimated to some very senior members of university management before that we are sending a very, very negative signal to existing and potential students and those persons who might be financially responsible for their studies by saying to them, oh, well, you know, we're very sorry, but you can't come through the front door, but there is a service entrance at the back, you know? And of course there is a service entrance at the back, which has a ramp, which was not primarily designed for wheelchair access, but for access for printing um, stuff or, you know, bulk deliveries and that kind of thing. Certainly a lot of our older buildings don't have um, elevators, you know, and my office, of course, is on the top floor of, of, of a building. And sometimes I get to work and I really don't feel like I want to walk up four flights of stairs to get to my office, but I'm forced to do so because there's no other way to get up to my office easily. Yes, I can use the um, entrance around the side of the building, but that means I've got to then walk all the way around the building, get to the other side, get into the building, move my way across to this side of the building and then hope that the access through the upstairs of the building is clear and I'm not interrupting anyone or any other meetings that might be on the go because otherwise I've got no opportunity when I'm unable to access my place of work. Um, now, I, I, I am fortunate in that I, I can get around more easily than some other students, but there are those barriers. They are there. They, if, when you know what you're looking for, it actually starts to st stand out at you. And so, you know, I, I took students around and I showed them various um, instances where I thought that something was lacking, where it's long overdue that a ramp should have been inserted for per persons to be able to gain those access to those buildings. And I'm not now just talking about the main administration block. I'm talking about um, residence halls, I'm talking about dining halls. Um, one particular instance where I, I showed students a flight of stairs and said, how would you negotiate that? And the uh, students, well, they were all sort of sat there wondering, you know, that this had not actually crossed their minds. So it, it, it started to, I guess, create questions in their own minds as to exactly how universities should be approaching these kind of things. I took them around to a residence hall and I showed them a similar situation where even if you are able to act, gain access over a flight of stairs, you are still presented with a, an entrance portal that is actually not totally flat. You've still got to be able to negotiate some form of rain or some form of barrier, physical barrier, and that does not make access to that building quite, um, it, it's not easy at all. Um, in some instances, um, the doors have to be open on both sides. So the doors are actually quite narrow. So if you're in a wheelchair, you're going to have a difficult time getting in there unless both doors are open for you. And so, uh, you know, we, we see these things all the time. And I then went down the road and I said, you know, don't just look at the buildings themselves. You know, the surrounding architecture of the buildings is important as well. Walkways, um, access ways. How many of these have not been managed or they have not been kept up so that perhaps roots growing from trees have disturbed the pavement? The pavement now has become very uneven. So if you are not sure of foot, you might have a problem. If you're in a wheelchair, you might have a bigger problem. Um, the point is it doesn't make it easy to be able to negotiate those areas. Ramps that go across stormwater drains sometimes are there, other times they are not there, sometimes they are uneven or they, they might be cracked or broken. And there are instances where we see ramps that go from a, a pavement or pedestrian walkway to a zebra crossing so that someone with a disability might be able to cross the road at that point. But whoever looked at the parking arrangement area of the was not paying attention to how a disabled person might be able to cross there because right in front of that um, little ramp that goes from the pedestrian walkway onto the uh, zebra crossing, there is a parking area. 
a parking bay. And in, on that day, there was actually a car parked there. And so all I was doing was posing questions. We went around to one of the, one of the university residences and I said, well, here we have an example of a ramp, but the ramp was, is, is so steep that unless you've got a, a wonderful braking system, you know, if you lose control of your, of your balance or if you lose control of your wheelchair, you're going to go all the way down that ramp and you will not be able to stop until the door stops you. And so he went down and had a look at the door and said to them, well, how are we going to open this door? Okay, well, there's a little magnetic key card here so we can get out our student card and we can lean over there and tap it so the lock is disengaged. But guess what? The door doesn't open inwards, it opens outwards. So if you're sitting in front of this chair, this door now and you're in a, in a wheelchair, yes, I've got the ability to open this door so I can get access, but I can't get access because the door opens the wrong way and it's going to open right into my wheelchair. Um, you know, and I mean, it, it, it was actually fascinating because I started to take notes myself. And, um, and anyway, so we carried on, we were walking further around and then we found some of the newer infrastructure on campus. And I said, right now here, we've got some newer buildings, but let's just have a look at, see what the accessibility of these buildings is like. And in that respect, the accessibility is a lot better. There are, a pro there are ramps, there are flat entrances. Um, but they are not without their faults. You know, I've seen situations where one can get access to the top area of a building, but then you can't get downstairs. So if you're going to access a, a, the lecture venue, you can only access the lecture venue on that level, which means you're going to sort of just come in the top there on the flat area, turn into a, a lecture hall, and you'll be at the door. And you, that means that you are then elevated and you are far away from the uh, whiteboard, and if you happen to have ocular problems that you need something more than just reading glasses, you know, you're actually now at the back of the venue. Um, so unless you actually go right out to the building and go right around the building, down the ramps to the bottom and come in through the bottom door, you're stuck where you are. Um, and then I took, this, I took these students around the front of the building and I said, right, well, here's a, here's a set of ramps. And that is commendable. I mean, this, this, this is, this is forward thinking now, and this is getting to what Des was talking about, universal access and universal design. But then I said, how would you negotiate with these ramps going uphill for such a long period? Um, the ramp starts here, but the building, I think, is about 20 meters away, and you have to negotiate a series of ramps that are so steep. You're going to tie your arms out just to get to the top of, the, of this ramping structure before you can wheel yourself into the bottom um, part of the building. Um, when it comes to ablution facilities, I will say the ablution facilities are on point. Those, those are great. But there are other venues um, that I've seen where one can gain access to a building, but similarly, the doors open the wrong way. They're not dual hinged. Um, I've, seen, I've seen a situation where the access is via a magnetic key card component, which you tap here, so the door opens or it unlocks, but you still got, got to then negotiate a door that opens outwards and it, it, it creates a barrier for that person to be able to gain access to that building. Now, assuming that you can get through that building, you are now stuck between two sets of glass doors and you've got to now open the second set of glass doors. And if you get through that set of glass doors, we can look around and the first thing you see in front of you is a massive staircase. But if we look to the left, there is an elevator, an elevator which at the time had not yet been commissioned and it was out of service. In fact, the front door was locked. You couldn't even gain access to it. But having a look at the size and, and um, dimensions of this, of this elevator, it, be, it was very, very clear that you would only ever be able to, if you were wheelchair bound, go in, say, forward, but you wouldn't be able to turn the wheelchair around in there. So you've probably got to lean over your shoulder and tap the floor one or floor two behind you and the elevator can take you up and then you've got to wheel yourself out backwards. Um, or alternatively, you've got to wheel yourself in backwards and then you can press whichever button you need to press to get upstairs and then you can go out forwards. But you know, there's no ways that someone can actually go into an elevator going forward and come out of that same elevator going forward. Um, you know, and. It, why I make a, 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 a point at these things out is that it's 
it might be a possible to negotiate those elevators. It might be possible to get in and get out. Um, but you know, it 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 does actually place a bit of an encumbrance on that on that on that person in that they don't have the same ease of access to all the facilities in that building as an able-bodied person might might be able to access that building. And that points to the, those, these issues of social justice. It points to these issues around um, your constitutional right to free access, constitutional right to education. Um, and I think it also points to, oh, well, you know, it's, it's nice to, um, we can give you the uh, access to um, tertiary education, but unfortunately, when it comes to this building, you're going to have a bit of a problem. And that in itself is problematic. Um, when it comes to the enjoyment of um, social activities and sporting activities, I said, well, if someone who's in a wheelchair wants to go and watch a cricket match at this, at this venue, I said, right, we've got access to, the, to this building through the okay ramping structure, and we can get in onto a flat area and we can wheel out onto the other side. But when you get onto the other side, there is no ramping structure that allows you to, for that, anyone in a wheelchair to get down onto, onto the playing fields or onto the spectators area. So you are stuck on this platform, but can you see anything? No, you can't because the wall or the, um, there's a retaining wall there. And that wall is built to such a height that anyone who's in a wheelchair can't see over it. Um, you know, and I mean, I, I, I pointed these things out just to create an awareness of things that so many people don't see or maybe they don't appreciate because those aren't the kind of challenges they, they've had to experience in their own lives. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying that to, this to point out all the negatives. There are certainly instances where, you know, persons with disabilities have been accommodated. I remember when I was in first year, the Dean of Students put, put out a survey amongst the first years to say, what would you like to see changed in this university regarding the physical infrastructure or, or words to that effect? And I immediately responded because I grew up on, 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 on a university campus. My father was a career academic as well. And I spent a lot of time walking in and around university buildings. And my response was, do you realize that the in this building, the stairwells only have one banister and it's on this side of the building. That means that if I am going upstairs, I don't necessarily have anything to hold on to. You know, and for someone who's not sure-footed, I'm not very sure-footed. Um, I've, I've gone up and down a couple of staircases in my time. Um, but it would certainly help if I had something that I could at least balance myself on. And I think within six months, every single staircase in that particular building had a banister railing placed on both sides of the stairwell. So that, you know, there are instances where accommodations have been made. But I think, you know, the debate now is looking, you know, just what has happened in the past already, but it's saying, where are we going to from now? So, you know, where do we go from here? And from my from my personal perspective it would be that we can't just sit back and say oh well heritage buildings are what they are and they need to remain what they were um Gaze made a comment just now to say that uh, oxford and cambridge got it right um i think tertiary ed institutions and higher education institutions in south africa have to take a long-term view to changing their physical and capital infrastructure to make those old buildings accessible to all. And of, of the smaller universities and the smaller um, universities of technology might have, you know, try and delay thinking on that on the basis that they've got fiscal constraints. They don't have the same economies of scale as some of the bigger universities. That may be a constraint in the short term, but I think we have to have a long term view on this. And it can't be on the basis that, okay, well, we're just going to ignore all of this and hope that it's going to go away. I don't think anyone that I've ever come across where I've had these conversations has that view or holds that view that we can basically just say, you know, well, this, you know, we can't accommodate this, therefore we aren't going to do anything about it. Having that kind of attitude to my mind would be um, going against everything that we're trying to achieve in terms of social justice, in terms of universal access. Um, in terms of universal design going forward. 
Um, what I would like to see is in terms of the old buildings, accommodations being made, universities looking at medium to long-term plans. Certainly there are short-term things that can be done in terms of repairs and maintenance, in terms of access to, this, to the buildings via the surrounding walkways. Um, those, those kind of things I think are quite easily um, repairable. But maybe a little bit of consideration needs to be given in a medium to longer term as to how access to these older buildings can be facilitated and medium to long term financial planning needs to take place so these things can and do happen. When it comes to our newer buildings, the thing that I don't want to see and the thing that I've, I've seen before, and it, it is frustrating, I think, when you see the plans for a new building and you find that accommodation has been given or some sort of thinking has gone into how, how can this university or how can this building accommodate persons with disabilities? But with all due respect, my personal view in some cases that that is just paying mere lip service to the desire to be seen to be looking after the interests of persons with disabilities. You know, um, to have a, 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 a newer building that does have a lift, but the lift cannot accommodate a wheelchair that can do 360 degrees. Um, doors that aren't multi-hinged, um, buildings that don't have flashing lights in case of persons who might have a disability and that they can't hear. What happens if a, if a fire starts somewhere on the other side of the building, an alarm goes off, someone who is hearing impaired will not necessarily hear that alarm. So are they going to be left to their own device or their friends are going to have to whip them out the building before they get overcome by smoke? The point is, I would like to see a flashing light system that indicates with arrows on the roof or something, this is the way to go to get to the nearest exit point. Um, I don't see a lot of that kind of forward thinking going into uh, some of the architecture that I've seen. Um, it's something that needs to be considered. And I think it's something that's important that needs to be taken into account in you know, medium to long-term planning. And part of that is getting access to in, uh, fiscal resources and other resources that will enable them to do these things in a cost-effective manner, but still at the same time protecting the rights of persons with disabilities. Because the last thing we want is to have growth targets in a university or um, have our infrastructure expanded and then find that students with disabilities who would otherwise like to attend that institution decide after a couple of months that they can't really handle it anymore because their ability to access or enjoy all the benefits that other, other students and other persons on the campus have are being limited through um, unforeseen. And I think generally it's, it's unforeseen. You know, it's, it's, it's a case that so many things that are now clearly apparent to me aren't clear to the people that make these decisions, the, guy, the people that are in, in charge, the people that are putting the blueprints together, the people that are planning forward as to how these tertiary institutions are going to grow, what the um, infrastructure of the newer buildings is going to look like. I think there is a lot that can be done, but what we cannot do is just sit back and say, well, there are other bigger universities or there are other universities that can cater for this type of um, um, disability. So we are going to focus on accommodating this type of of uh, disability. We can't do that either. Um, to cherry pick and say, this is what we are going to um, focus on, this is what we're going to accommodate, is not universal access. It's universal access for one particular type of disability. It's not universal access for all persons with disabilities. So those are just some of my thoughts. And uh, again, thanks very much to Kazai and, and, and Des and, and the team for having me on. And uh, I hope, I hope what I've shared with you this afternoon is, um, is of value and it'll stimulate further dialogue going on. So Ruda, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Richard, for, for, for that uh, presentation. Thank you so much for, for sharing your personal experiences with us. Uh, I think it's, it's very important to, to have someone who uh, someone who is living with a disability come here and, and speak to us and share, you know, about the kind of difficulties that you are facing in terms of accessing um, buildings. Um, 
and you know it's 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 of great importance in in these type of of conversations that we try to have that we when we try to promote transformation you know within our society so i would just like to thank you for for that presentation uh once again i would just like to open up for for anyone who who has a comment anyone who has a question uh i see your hand there precious you can go ahead all right. Um, thank you, Paul, um, Rudo, and um, Richard, uh, and as well as Desire, for such a you know wonderful presentation. And I just wanted to follow up on on Richard and as well as what you mentioned, Rudo, about um, the issue of participation, um, in which is very crucial when we talk about universal design. And um, and when I talk about participation, I'm also talking about as you said, you know, the participation of this learners with different disabilities, the physical and the invisibilized disabilities as well. And I'm also talking about also the role of the professionals themselves that are actually responsible for the architecture that is found around university. So I'm talking about the architectures themselves. So my question to, um, to Richard as well as Desire, and I think it's directed to all of them, is that um, how, in, in your studies, like, did you find that, you know, the architectures themselves, were they actually also involved in the decision making of how universities should transform in terms of architecture and, and, and the design itself? Were they also like very much aware of inclusion issues and, 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 and also the participation of, 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 of the people that are involved in, in, in the process? So I'm talking about the professionals that are involved because obviously we are here as and I take it we are social people, we are social science people, but uh, at the end of the day, it's up to the architectures themselves and the people from the engineering and built environment. Are they also uh, you know, part of this discussion of, of inclusion issues that actually affect social policies and social inclusion? Thank you. Mm. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, that question, Precious. Um, yeah, look, I think, look, I, the, the, the architecture, I think do play an active role in these in these um, in these uh, design phase um, thinking strategies, but I think in many instances what they can and cannot do or what they can and cannot um, propose is limited by fiscal constraints or size constraints. Um, you know, it, it it's not easy just to plonk a big building that accommodates enough space for everything on a piece of building that is not big or a piece of land that's not big enough to accommodate that. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, spatial and fiscal constraints that go into those, those into the decision making there. And I think, and, and what I think is going to happen is that you're going to see a lot of new architecture going up, which is sound in, in principle in the, in the manner in which it's been constructed. And yes, I think it does actually take into account needs of dis disabled persons to a point. But then when questions start being asked about universal access and the extent to which universal access has actually been taken into account, you find that there's going to be a lot of comebacks to say, this needs to be altered, this needs to be changed, this needs to be, you know, so th th I, I don't think in my experience that there's enough thinking that's going into the design of these buildings. I think there's a certain amount of thinking but often it's, I don't think it's enough to be able to um, say that we've, uh, we've ticked that box to say we are accommodating everyone on a universal level. Um, mm. And you know, ultimately that ends up driving up the, the, the costs when you have to come back and keep changing things or alter things after the fact because X, Y, and Z has now been brought to the table to say, hang on, this is not totally compliant in terms of you know, legislation which requires us to consider universal access. Uh, Desa, you've got anything to add to that? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Precious, for your very insightful question. I think from my side, uh, when it comes to architectures, uh, there is one case uh, at one university based in the free state. So uh, one of my participants said that they were consulted by the architecture. They wanted to construct a new building for guests, you know, who come for conferences and stuff for accommodation. So they consulted the disability uh, unit staff members, the unit, you know, including other persons with disabilities, wheelchair users, you know, to try and get their views on universal accessibility. 
but you know and then they provided their views but the when the building was finished you know when they went they the building was inaccessible and they they mm. reported the matter so you that goes to show that even though they consult with a uh, disability unit staff members but when it comes to the implementation i don't know maybe it has to do with trying to cut the costs so there is an issue of mm. power you know you know disability staff members in most universities deep, despite them having knowledge on how accessibility should be, but in terms of who makes the important decisions, you know, that's the matter, you know, that that what matters most. And mm -hmm. those decisions are made uh, in line of how much money they are willing to spend on accessibility. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, quite right, Thank you, thank you for that. Um... Dr. Chwandire and, and Richard, um, is there is there any other comments there or maybe we can just, um, I see Kudzai, Kudzai, you, you, I see in the comment section there, you're reiterating on your point that uh, you were asking before, you know, that's why I was asking if there is any empathy at all, Doc. Um, yeah, uh, I think for, uh, for now, let us just move on to to our third presenter. Thank you so much, uh, Richard Poole. Our third presenter okay. is uh, Zianda Febana, who I had introduced, her network had dropped, but uh, she is now back with us. Uh, it's good to have you back, Zianda. I will just um, hand over to you now, and then you can uh, present. Sianda, are you with us? I see her name in the participants. I'm just not sure if uh, she's having troubles, network troubles again. Uh, she appears to have dropped out, Shudo. I'm here. <laughs> okay, I think Zianda is having network problems. Um, can uh, you hear? Me? Yes, we can hear you, Zianda. You can you can go ahead. Uh, today, all of my network issues have <laughs> decided to come down at this moment. Um, I'm not sure if you got my presentation. Um, and can I please ask you to sh share it? Could I? Or uh, uh, I'm I'm yet to receive that email. I'm still just waiting for it. Okay, I sent it to Rudo uh, on my side as I was having technical issues. Uh, let me just check this, Yanda, and. Uh... Okay, so while we're still checking, I think I can then go ahead with my um, present, with my um, conversation. Um, sorry, everyone, um, I'm having quite a lot of network issues, but they seem to be resolved right now. Um, my name is Yanda Febana, and I am um, doing a study on the conservation of historical architecture, and I am looking at Rhodes University as a case study. Um, I think I would like to thank my colleagues um, who have started this conversation on um, what historical architecture is and also how does it, um, how does it compete with uh, the transformation agenda of higher education, especially for students with disabilities. Um, so my presentation is talking, I'm, I'm asking the question in terms of whose heritage is it anyway? So whose heritage are we preserving and why? And I want us to start with uh, just talking briefly about what heritage architecture is and um, what it means uh, my quote in the beginning talks about what placemaking is. Placemaking involves not only the physical transformation of the built environment, 
but also the inscription of symbolic meaning, cultural values, normative prescriptions into the urban arts, um, urban landscape. And I think having this conversation right now, when we are in our her in the heritage month, is very quite is is an important one to to reflect about. What does heritage architecture then mean in this context? Um, heritage, heritage architecture is an important part of a place's identity, a testament to its history. And then architectural landmarks therefore represent the image of a specific society that, and that of a certain period. Uh, I'm going to try sharing again. Uh, let's see. Um, you'd let me know if you can see my screen, colleagues. Yes, yes, Zienda, we can. I can see your screen. I'm, uh, I don't know about everybody else. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So then, therefore, architecture then becomes physical evidence that an area was constructed and established, right? However, recognizing the historic relationship architecture has in South Africa is, is a problematic venture, as the historical architecture in South Africa is a continuum space of subtle reminders of the legalized segregation instituted through the apartheid government, which was nuanced with violence, exclusion, and marginalization. So in South Africa, one can argue um, that the evidence of constructing and establishing a space uh, for South Africans entailed a process of exclusion and total denial of social, internal, and external spaces. Now let's look at historical architecture in South Africa. In layman's term, architecture in South Africa was used as a tool to rule, to control, and exhort power over nations and colonies. And during the colonial period, much of the practice of heritage management has reflected the interest of the colonial masters and hardly considered the aspirations of the local communities. Um, so if you go to places like uh, Gramstown, you would see the infrastructure and the architecture is very much uh, representative of uh, a colonial period. And this you'll find specifically in towns like Stellenbosch or Little Dorties or, uh, or, or in Gramstown and none of um, the local communities. So symbolically then architecture for South Africa symbolizes power to control who has access to places where these places are situated, and thus it exercises um, the it exercises to maintain architectural so therefore exercises to maintain architectural um, heritage aims to maintain such power. Simply put, in any part of the debate, you would have to agree that the conservation of architecture. When we say we're conserving historical buildings, what are we preserving? So therefore it is at its most basic, a political issue. Now let's look at heritage at landscape in higher education. So while heritage um, architecture is about continuous maintenance of a place such as that its significance is retained and secured, heritage management has been a byproduct of colonialism. And we can all agree, as the previous speakers have alluded to, universities, at least especially, were not designed for marginalized groups in mind, particularly people with disabilities. Which is why I think um, Dr. Dez shared in terms of the, the policies that we have right now, which all point for inclusive education, but um, somehow are inconsistent in terms of how is that if there's no universal design where universities can adopt this to be in, um, inclusive for um, students with 
disabilities. Uh, and then we have the National Heritage Resources Act, which then protects buildings which are older than 60 years. So meaning that this all should be um, modified um, so that it can keep its own knowledge or, or of this instance. However, um, this means that then the transformation in terms of accessibility for students with disabilities is, um, is much more delayed. And as Dr. Dez uh, pointed out, that it's the university that has to apply to preserve this um, architecture. And my research looks at if this is not a, a system that is automatically done, why then do universities apply to um, uh, for this uh, protection of their universities? It, it seems as if um, there is an inconsistency in terms of them accepting and opening up the universities for students with disabilities, but then at the same time would use that same would use the same act to preserve this. Um, heritage architecture. So um, as this research and this thinking was started around, um, you know, the road must fall movement. And these political campaigns, particularly road must fall, royal uh, must fall, sought to lay out the, the rest, to lay to rest the historical legacy of oppression, injustice seen in heritage architecture in historically white universities. These campaigns were not just about the physical removal of the statues, but rather challenging the notion of transformation. Many believe that these universities cons cons conserving colonial influence while diminishing the needs of the marginalized groups, notably in this case, um, people with physical disabilities, struggle to exercise independent social um, existence and I, I indeed effectively excluded due to the inappropriate design of historically white universities. Now, as I said, I'll be using um, Rhodes University as a, a case study, which I have already um, started with the data collection. And there's a reason why I chose um, uh, Rhodes University as my as 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 my case study, right? As we all know, that Rhodes University is named after Cecil Rhodes, who amusingly was was keen only for establishing a university in Cape Town, which was to be modeled on his college, uh, Oriel College. And to date, Rhodes University is still referred to as a colonial institution. Um, in the campaigning of getting a, a university in the Eastern Cape and in the Grahamstown, it was Judge uh, Jones of the Eastern Cape District in, who confidently stated that Grahamstown needed to be chosen as the location of the university because Grahamstown is likely um, to retain its white supremacy, right? Now this goes back to, to saying that architecture is not neutral. Architecture is a political statement. Therefore, when you are re, um, conserving and preserving architecture, you are then also um, symbolically um, preserving the colonial stature of the university. Undoubtedly, Rhodes University's connection with the British Empire continued to be cemented in symbolic ways in the institution to date. Uh, more obvious is the conservation of British architecture, such as heritage. As we said, there's no such thing as a neutral design. And this study adopts uh, Schindler's um, architectural uh, exclusion of architecture. And she looks at and argues that the built environment reflects society's values and beliefs. And inclusion here in is the subtle ways that the built environment has been used to keep certain segments of the population separate from others. So she argues that um, even though we have evolved uh, in and transformation and, and there's no more segregation, people who still believe in segregating uh, 
various groups in society use architecture to continue excluding certain groups from accessing certain things. So by architectural exclusion, she says that, I mean, it's the way we have designed our cities to physically exclude people from certain parts. There are numbers of ways we have done this, from physical divisions like barriers, having high fences um, and walls, to infrastructural decisions about where, where to do, sorry, where to do, uh, where people must in place uh, transit, transit stops, and how we design our streets. Where do we make one-way streets? And where do we put a sidewalk? And where don't we put a sidewalk? In all of this, we are trying to control how people have um, and how people use the environment. So then design in itself, architectural design functions as symbolic violence because it is involved with creating and reproducing the ideas and practices that result in structural and other types of violence. And if you can see how we continue to conserve um, heritage architecture, but we will know that conserving this heritage architecture means a portion of our students um, do not have access in this need. It means that then it's the university who are symbolically excluding and intentionally excluding students with disabilities out, out of their campuses just like it was done before. Uh, I brought a couple of pictures here um, that speak to architectural design and how we can design architecture in a way that excludes people. Now, these are just a few examples. For instance, if you can see this bench, on the on casual observation, you think that it's just a normal bench, but this is part of a hostile exclusion uh, project which means that people who um, are homeless and unable to sleep in these branches, benches simply because of um, the barriers in between them. This also, we've seen these different spikes. These prevent people from sitting, right? This is subtle ways that architecture can tell you how to act. I'm sure we've seen that last bench on the how train where you are unable to sit, because the idea is not for you to sit, you are supposed to be in transit, right? This is how architecture has been used to control people's behavior. And my argument in this um, thesis is that we have moved, if we, we need to understand the exclusion of students and people and staff with disabilities in, in, in universities, to be a symbolic violence because there's a continuous um, and continuous and somewhat intentional uh, ignorance of how architecture has been used um, to, to, to exclude people with disabilities. If you look at our campuses, it's where the ramp is, is where um, you, students would go to, right? Where in at Rose University, uh, when I got there and I didn't see any, oh, sorry about the noise at the back, and I didn't see anyone with a physical disability, I started then looking around the campus and then understanding the campus in itself physically does not accommodate people with physical disabilities. So they welcomed you in terms of policies and application, but when you get into the campus, it subtly excludes you out of the campus, just based on the infrastructure. And this is the daily re reality of it. And my argument in this is that when we think of heritage architecture, especially in this heritage month, let's also think of how architecture has been used and is continued to be used to um, exclude people with disabilities. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zianda, for, for, for that interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I would just like to open it up now to the floor. If there is anyone with comments, questions for Zianda, for, for, for Richard, or for, for Dr. Desire. Um, yes. Prof. Melissa Stein, I see your hand there. You can go ahead. Uh, yeah. 
thanks, thanks, Ruda, and thank you very much to all three presenters for this really stimulating and thought-provoking afternoon. Um, you know, I think if if I hadn't understood ableism as privilege before, I really have this afternoon. Um, and I think in particular, um, the whole question of, of ableist ignorance has, has really hit me hard today. Um, just how able-bodied people just don't bother to get to know because, you know, they just don't have to, you know, they just can exist without ever getting to understand um, any of the ways in which um, disability exclusion operates through, through architecture. Um, so yeah, I, I really want to thank you very sincerely for this, this very, very um, profoundly insightful afternoon. Um, so then I also just want to make a, another comment, which, which is just, you know, something that strikes me is that all the people that have joined this afternoon are linked to the center. Either you work at the center or students at the center, um, which, which also just really interests me because usually we would have a number of people, um, you know, from wherever joining in because the topic interests them. And it just strikes me again how when we do work on disabilities, um, how that lack of, of any sense of the importance of getting to understand the issues around um, disability just, just is so pervasive and, and how people just don't exert themselves to get to understand. So, you know, for me, it's no accident that the only people that are here this afternoon are people who are already involved in the center's work one way or another. It's shocking, but, but nevertheless, um, um, you know, very, very telling and just shows how hard we have to work to make people aware of how ableist privilege creates ignorance and creates um, no sense of the need to know. Um, so there, that's me on my little box for a moment. But, but I do want to ask, um, Prof Des, you, you mentioned people who, who have given up their studies because of the incredible obstacles that they face and um, just navigating their way around the campus. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, did you encounter examples of people who actually sort of steered their studies in particular directions because of questions of, of access to particular buildings? Like, for example, that, you know, the, the science building might just be too difficult and therefore taking, I don't know, maths, you know? Because I think that that's quite, quite a telling form that oppression takes very often. You know, like um, women who are told, you know, not to go out at night because they might get raped. So you as a woman change your lifestyle um, because, because of the threat of violence from men. Um, or, you know, um, women students who, who sometimes change courses because, because of um, male um, lecturers who, who, you know, sort of make sexual overtures and they don't feel powerful enough to be able to do anything about it. So they compromise on their own ambitions and their own desires for themselves. Um, so I'm wondering if you found examples of that. Sorry, that was a bit of a longer speech than I meant to make. Thank, thank you, Prof. Uh, I think from my research, I didn't find, uh, let me see. In terms of, you know, it's something that I've come across in the literature where certain students with disabilities end up choosing certain courses or mm. they are 
forced to choose certain courses. In many cases, they, uh, it's always difficult for them if they want to enroll for sciences, sciences, hardcore sciences oriented subjects. There's always that idea of like, you want to excel in mathematics. You know, it's mainly yeah. like as certain departments not believing in the potential of persons with disability. So it's more about seeing the disability first before the individual, right? And secondly, when it comes to accessibility of buildings, there is also an issue of disability activism, student activism. So you'll find out that students who are involved in disability activism on campus, especially by activism through the SRC, they have actually played an important role to, uh, to actually, uh, what do you call, raise issues of disability awareness, you know, engaging the management to ensure that they make the universities accessible, you know. So that has mainly been with students who are involved in disability activism, which is why it's important for students themselves to be involved because they will talk from a lived experiences rather than them having to rely on disability unit staff members to do it on their behalf. So yeah, I think that's all I have come across, you know, so far. I haven't seen, I didn't come across any cases of universities, perhaps. Universities have been trying to be flexible. Let's say if there's a student with a physical disability, then they will change the venue to another building, which is maybe the lecture will be on the ground floor, right? Mm. So mm. I think that's how I can answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Uh, could Zaya see your hand is up? You can go ahead. Um, thank you, Rudo. Um, I think my mind is also very much to thank all the presenters. And I would also want to comment and maybe this can, uh, maybe as Yanda can also um, have something to say if need be. But I liked the, the approach that you're using for your research, particularly because it ties uh, together uh, the idea of or the institution of coloniality and disability that uh, you, you, you see you frame these issues more from a um, decolonial perspective where you're saying that uh, disability and ableism does not necessarily do not necessarily stand alone but they really are tied together and connected in, in different ways. And, and, I, and you just reminded me of, uh, and I think the rest of uh, people from the center can also um, agree with me on how it connects to our, the conference we had in 2019, which was titled like the, when you showed the, those uh, benches slash chairs where you say that the planning of them is to exclude. And, and and I remember that conference we were looking at how it is not necessarily it's, it's not always the case that disability limits people um, from doing certain things, but that the institutions and the structures themselves are, are disabling. And, and that's what I that's what I also saw from that uh, from that that's what I also thought of from that from that uh, picture that. Um, it does sort of really show that while we do have these exclusions based on people living, I mean, centered on people living with disabilities, they do tend to a certain degree affect uh, most marginal bodies. Uh, and, and I thought about the sitting arrangements, like the what sitting arrangement you showed at the how train. And I, I was thinking about how a lot of sort of public administration offices government offices uh, don't even have benches to sit, at, to sit at at all. And then you begin to see how both coloniality and ableism really are based, are systems that lead to discomforts for, for, for a lot of people. But just yeah, just to, to wrap it up, by, wrap, it, wrap up my comment by saying, I like the, the lenses that you use uh, of um, um, the, the, the intersection between coloniality and, and ableism and disability, and, and, and perhaps that that issue, because we do have a general issue based on the Disabling Activities Conference, I think that issue could also be of interest towards um, the work that you, you've set out to achieve. Um, thank you, Chair. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you for that for that comment, Kudzaya. I don't know if you would like to respond to that, uh, Zianda, if you would just like to, to comment back to Kudzaya on that. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, I think it's very important that we we speak of the perpetuated of um, certain groups, right? If we understand that society is unequal, it was it has been built to be unequal, and those in power um, would not necessarily give up their power, but find ways in which to. Um, uh, uh, what do you call this, maintain the superiority, right? And if you can understand then how architecture in itself has been used um, in, you know, in the process of uh, spatial, spatial um, exclusion, we then uh, quick can draw the, the similarities, you know, it goes, it, it, it's in our daily lives so much that we do not even realize it, right? When I was speaking on um, how architecture controls a lot, and having this conversation um, with my colleagues at Unisa, I was saying, think of the grocery aisle, right? If you go to the grocery aisle, the, the sweets there before the before the till are meant to be there for you because the suppose that might not always have to be but for you to be preoccupied they'll make sure that you continue buying until you get to the checkout point which is the common way um to segregate people um there's a reason why um in the urban white neighborhoods the the, the walls are high there's a reason bridges in certain places and not bridges in other places, just trucks, right? So the, the same control that has been used architecturally to maintain segregation is also can, how we can understand how the colonial perspective when you are looking uh, at this certain point. And also just going back to, you know, at the point that uh, uh, Dr. Dez was, was responding to in terms of, um, you know, we do in find that in some of the findings, most students do humanity, like science and maths. And it's not that they don't qualify, but even if they do apply and they do get accepted, they end up changing because in the humanities, the structure of the humanities actually is much more welcoming. And also the curriculum is much more adaptable for students' disabilities, right? So you do find that certain places are aware of this and then lose advantage, right? So if we then have to ask ourselves that if this is historical structure, then it should belong in a museum. If we want, if we want inclusivity, then we need to undo the structure because education in itself, university was a colonial project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Zianda. I see Precious's hand just went up. You can go ahead, Precious. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Zianda, for that presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. And I'm also like glad that you mentioned the issue of curriculum and how curricula has got that um, symbolic uh, power to actually exclude. And um, so, you know, we've mentioned a lot about physical exclusion, but we hardly have we, we ever talk about how, you know, exclusion can be symbolic and it actually talks about things that are non you know, physical in, in, in their entities, like the curriculum itself. And we also need to be very wary of that. So how do, how does the architectural, how does the architecture symbolically exclude uh, all learners uh, with uh, different uh, physical abilities and, and differing uh, identities? 
And um, just to echo also on Melissa's point of how, you know, when we talk about, you know, when we, or when, whenever we have um, discussions on disability inclusion, we hardly ever have a lot of, uh, you know, people that are engaging on it and how, how, how should we solve it? And I, I, I really am pondering on that. And I think um, the point that uh, Ziander and um, Kuzi mentioned actually is part of the solution that we need also to place and to strategically place uh, disability inclusion with other, you know, various, um, you know, identities, you know, like, you know, race, uh, class, uh, you know, um, sexuality, gender, and all that. And that is how we can actually be, make people aware that disability doesn't stand alone, it actually stand with various, uh, you know, identities. And whenever we talk about physical, inclusion of architecture when, when perhaps when you talk about how we need to be inclusive when we're building toilets on campus maybe we need to talk about how we are, can actually you know incorporate learners with different uh you know sexualities as well and and different you know um identities in that aspect not just disability on its own so that is what i'm just thinking about thank you Thank you, Precious, uh, for, for bringing up, you know, that aspect of also looking at learners with uh, different uh, sexualities as well. Um, I would just like to ask if there is anyone else who has comments or questions, we can take another round. Um, any last remarks? I see Dr. Desire you wonder if you have something to say, you can go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add on what uh, Precious has just said. I think it's a very important point. You know, it's often referred to as disability mainstreaming, you know, and most South African uh, disability policies, including the strategic policy framework, yes, that concept that, you know, universities need to mainstream issues of disability inclusion. So it's only on paper, not in practice. Uh, so I think what is important is for universities to take proactive measures to ensure that they put this into practice to mainstream disability issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doc. Just uh, as, we, as we are thinking of last uh, remarks, I would just like to remind you colleagues to please check out our conference on the 6th of October. Check out the link is in, is there in the chats. You can um, register to attend. Registration is free. Any last uh, remarks from the presenters maybe? All right. I think I think if there if there is none, I would just like to 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 thank you all for for joining us and having this conversation today. Um, I think it was a a, a great uh, stimulating conversation that we had. Thank you to our presenters, uh, Dr. Desire Chiwandere. Thank you, Zianda, and thank you, Richard. Thank you to to everyone who attended this session today. Um, if that is all, I think we will see you guys next time. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.